you see the nervousness in the market that's happening now, and, and you know the, the, the slightest news can spook the Dow down a thousand points in a day. I think, <laughs> you know, everyone is worried about that Lehman moment. It could be anything, or it could be nothing. It could just be people start selling, like selling to get selling, stops are triggered, and boom, down it goes. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Lobo Tigre from The Independent Speculator. Lobo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Good to be back on the show, Elijah. We've had quite a wild ride in the markets the last few weeks with more and more confirmation that we are in a crash scenario for the stock market and precious metals have followed markets all the way down. So your perspective where we are first when it comes to the general stock market? Well, I love you, bro, but no, precious metals haven't followed all the way down. Gold's at 1850 as you and I speak. If you look at a six month chart and you put the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, the Dow, and the Russell 2000, the major indices on there over the last six months since things really went into reverse, since the market started believing that the Fed would actually tighten, uh, you know, these, these, you know, big downward curves, you put Bitcoin on there, <laughs> gold 2.0, it's, it's down, you know, more than anything else. Uh, but gold is sideways. And, you know, okay, gold should be 3000 or 10,000 or whatever you like. But in an environment where the dollar has been strong, or on Forex, at least it appears strong, you know, Prius mayor at the glue factory, all that stuff. Um, and interest rates have been rising. Not just the Fed funds rate, but like the benchmark ten year going over three percent. Um, you know, so you've got rising rates and it's apparently strong dollar. These are headwinds for gold. For gold to be trading sideways in the face of those headwinds is actually outperformance. And if you look at gold two point for the major stock indices, you know, it's a terrific performance. So no whining allowed, Elijah. You know, the, the precious metals are fine. Yes, I get that silver is lagging here, but you know, it does have its industrial uses and it's and those are becoming more and more important in the pricing of silver and where that can hurt in the near term where people are worried about, you know, an economic downturn in the industrial demand for silver. It helps going forward because it's so essential. It is one of the critical minerals in the new energy paradigm. And that makes silver sort of the win-win metal going forward because it's still a monetary metal. And you know, once reality kicks in and you start building out all this green infrastructure, you've got to have silver for the solar part of it. So, sorry, a, a bit long winded there, but I had to push back a little bit because, you know, I'm not unhappy with precious metals at all and monetary metals, please. No, and it's definitely true that if you look on the longer term a chart, I mean, precious metals have done quite well in the last few years. If we look at um, where gold is, I mean, and even where silver is, if you just go back a few years, they've rallied quite a bit. So your perspective on the where this where the stock market goes from here, will we see strength in gold and silver, even if the stock market falls? OK, that was the question. You're right. Bring me back on track here, Elijah. So uh, I wouldn't call this a crash yet. A, a grind downwards over six months. It's not the same as the sort of waterfall events that we saw in 2008 uh, in the fall. Though it's kind of spooky if you think about it. If you look back at those charts, the, the markets really started turning south in late 2017. And they rolled over and they were doing this slow grind south, sort of what we're doing now. And then, you know, your Lehman event, something happens, people get scared, they panic and things start going, you know, the waterfall event. Uh, I think you see the nervousness in the market that's happening now. And, and you know, the, the, the slightest news can spook the Dow down a thousand points in a day. I think, you know, everyone is worried about that Lehman moment. It could be anything or it could be nothing. It could just be people start selling, that selling to get selling, stops are triggered and boom, down it goes. In a, in a market where everybody's nervous, 
And even with these big corrections, you know, I talked about, look at those six month charts, how all the stock indices have rolled over. They're still above pre-pandemic levels. You know, valuations, you know, people are talking about how great bargains that are out there. Kathy Wood says her high flying tech stocks are value plays. Now, no, they're not. You know, something that went up five times and is off 50 percent is still up two and a half times. Uh, and if it's not making any money, you know, the correct P.E. when there's no E is, uh, uh, in my view, basically zero. But anyway, so the outlook, I'm not predicting the great crash of 2022. I'm saying it, boy, the risk of it sure looks high. It looks higher to me than since really the uh, pandemic shutdowns in 2020. And um, there's a lot of directions we can go for that, but with that, but the simple thing, the simple message, what I'm telling my clients and what I'm doing with my own money is basically I've stopped any buying in advance of that. There are great bargains on the table now. You know, we, we talked about gold, silver sentiment and how down it is. And, you know, the, a lot of the stocks are down, even if the metals aren't. And there are great bargains there now. It's very tempting. But if we see another 2008-style waterfall event, there will be much better prices in a couple months ahead. And if not, I don't think they're going to take off and leave us behind. So the, the risk-reward right now, or the risk is to the downside right now and buying now. So I basically stopped all buying. That doesn't mean I'm all out. I haven't sold anything. I'm just not buying in front of what may be a waterfall event. I would much rather buy at much lower prices, average down in the positions that I have, should we be so lucky. My major focus right now is building cash, sending it to my brokerage account, so I'm ready to take advantage of this. And if it doesn't happen, uh, you know, we're in a commodity super cycle. We can talk about the reasons for that, what's going forward in the bigger picture, but plenty of time to make money after the immediate risk of a market crash passes or materializes into an opportunity. I think the main thing that people are concerned about with regard to holding cash, as you're uh, suggesting, is that we are seeing inflation at record highs above 8%, if you, even if you just go by the official numbers. So your take on that, um, people's concern about if they do hold cash, it's just sure. depreciating in value. Sure. No, I... I understand, but people are forgetting the different time scales here. I'm talking about holding cash for the next few weeks or a couple months. You know, eight and a half percent inflation, that's bad, but that's per year. Right? You know, if the if the inflation change is a is a whopping point six over a month to month, that's nothing compared to a fifty percent haircut if you deploy it into the market. So the I mean just the time scales and the you know, fifty percent losses versus point six loss due to inflation. The scales are completely out of proportion. So I, I just think these are separate things. They ought not to be thought together. I'm not talking about you know, cash for the long term. I'm talking about a near-term tactical positioning. I think that's a very important distinction to make there is, yeah, that the time frames, as you mentioned, are completely different there. Now, when it comes to the resource sector, it, it, that's largely what you cover on your site, theindependentspeculator.com. Uh, so you're looking for a possible downturn in that along with if we do see a further downside in the stock market, you're say, thinking that that will crash as well? Get hurt. You know, as uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, history hath shown. So history hath shown that when the markets crash, everything gets whacked. Absolutely everything gets whacked. Even your safe havens, gold, silver, which you think should not be whacked. They're safe havens. Well, but the reason why that happens is because, you know, people are jumping out of windows. People are faced with bills they can't pay. They sell anything that'll get a bid. And gold always has value. You always get a bid for your gold. So it's not that people want to sell gold in a crisis. It's that gold is the ultimate liquidity for a crisis. Gold is actually doing its job, providing liquidity when nothing else will. And, you know, and the stocks get whacked too. And it's not because people don't believe in the companies anymore. It's because margin clerks <laughs> are selling them for them. You don't, you don't decide to sell in that crash. Your margin clerk says, oh, you know, you're, you're uh, violating your margin limits. So we're going to sell some of your stock whether you want to or not. Um, you know, that's the bad news. You know, if there is a crash, you know, everything gets hurt. The good news is that these things that shouldn't get whacked, you know, nothing changes. The fundamentals don't change. Gold doesn't stop being gold. Uranium doesn't stop powering nuclear power plants. You know, the reality doesn't change. 
that means that these become terrific buying opportunities. And I, and I know that any long suffering, you know, gold bug doesn't want another buying opportunity. They just want it to go to 10,000 now. I understand. Uh, but the universe doesn't care what we want. Mr. Market doesn't call me up and ask me what I think he should do. So we just deal with, uh, if we play with the cards we're dealt, we don't get to deal with the cards. And if we're dealt the card of tremendous buying opportunity, then we grab that opportunity with both hands. That's, that's my plan. So, uh, you know, <laughs> building cash now has some opportunity cost, but it can result in life-changing benefits if we are so lucky as to get that crash. Now, now, why not sell everything in advance, you know, so I can buy lower? Because it might not crash. You know, the Fed is talking tough. We're going to fight inflation. Like those old Ford uh, Motor Company commercials, quality is job one. Now, you know, inflation is job one. That's what they say. Um, but, you know, it, <laughs> they can't be unaware of the weakness underneath the surface in the economy. They're trying the, – the signs of trouble out there, the global economy is – impact in the U.S. The uh, conference calls from Target and Walmart uh, were really market-shaking events this week. And I know the Fed pays attention to that sort of thing. So, and, and they could have a great excuse. You know, all it takes is something to happen in the war in Europe. And suddenly, oh, you know, we were going to fight inflation really, really. But, you know, this crisis happens. So now we have to have, be, have more commoditative policy. You, you could actually have the Fed pivot again right into the rescue tomorrow. I'm not promising that. I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying this is why I'm not selling everything because I think there's going to be a crash. It looks like there's a crash imminent, but who knows? Things have, have taken wild turns over the last years. Uh, so the way between, the way to, to hedge my bets is, is not to sell in front of this possibility, but to accumulate cash in front of this possibility and then deploy one way or the other, either with or without the crash, depending on how things shake out. But it seems like a very a conservative position as well. I mean, you're kind of playing both possibilities right now. It, it seems very prudent to have some uh, funds in the market right now. And if we do see a buying opportunity, having some cash on the side, because at the end of the day, even if we do see uh, you know, a crash in even the resource sector, it seems like fundamentals right now are going to be pushing them much higher in if we look more longer term. Yeah, well, I love that you say it that way. It's, it's kind of funny. I'm not often accused of being a conservative. I, I'm a wild and crazy speculator, right? But no, I'm not a gambler. I, I call myself a value speculator. And if you, if you know, it sounds contrarian, and it is, but if we are so lucky as to have Babies tossed out with the bathwater, and you can position yourself to catch those beautiful babies. Then they can grow up into wonderful things in the future. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, but I, I want to rewind to what we started to talk about earlier because, okay, gold and silver sells off. You know, clearly wrongheaded, and we've seen this in 2020, 2008. I wasn't there, but I, I have read that it was like this in other crashes. You had this very sharp V-shaped recovery. For gold, as soon as that liquidity, in, you know, squeeze passes from the crash, gold comes screaming back. That's not necessarily so for the industrial metals, and I, I'm not saying that I'm giving up or you know getting out of copper and all the other industrial metals that I like. I'm just saying that I don't see this being like 2020. It's not like the shutdown and then we open back up again and things come screaming back. I think we are looking at potentially protracted economic weakness. My, uh, my call actually since the COVID shutdowns has been for stagflation, and that's starting to happen now. In a stagflationary environment, you know, it's a mixed bag for the industrial middles. The flation part of stagflation will raise prices. The stag part of stagflation means less demand. So it's, you know, we'll have to see how that plays out for the industrial metals. And even if, the prices are high enough so it seems like, gee, all these miners should be making money hand over fist. Well, their input costs are higher too. Uh, you know, we, I, there's a free article at my website um, called Inflation is Great for Commodities Prices, but for Miners, Not So Much, or something like that. You should be able to search for that on my homepage, free article. Um, and I'm pointing out how the input costs can affect differently the miners, the developers, and the explorers. Um, so, 
All I'm saying is that's more complicated. Due diligence is required. You, you know, a shotgun approach to playing the industrial metals, if I'm right about stagflation with or without the crash uh, going forward, you know, it, well, you, need, you need to pick the quality companies. I would not pick an ETF basket approach to industrial metals or, or even copper, if I like copper, for example. Uh, and sorry, real quick, Elijah, I have to jump in there and, and pitch uranium. And uh, it's funny because there's so many uranium Uber bulls who don't like me because I'm the glass half empty guy. But honestly, I see uranium as the highest confidence trade of all this year. I mean, I have thoughts about how various things, gold, silver, copper, all these things will go. But absent a major nuclear incident, I see uranium prices going higher as an absolute necessity. You know, in, unless the whole sector goes away, they have to go higher. The demand is there. It's not just someday demand. It's happening now. You know, notably Japan restarting reactors. That was Rick Rule's famous, uh, you know, trigger that he was looking for. That's starting to happen. Europe pivoting back towards nuclear. The UK announcing bunches of new reactors. I mean, this is really starting to happen now. And, um, you know, it'll take a while for supply to catch up. And then, you know, you had Sput last year, the Sprott Trust hoovering up all the cheap pounds. So it's a really interesting setup. Um, and by the way, if there's a market crash, uranium gets whacked too, just like gold. Everything gets whacked. Uranium gets whacked. Uranium stocks get whacked. Has no impact whatsoever on base load energy, which nuclear power provides. So I would see that as just as terrific an opportunity to buy uranium stocks as I would gold stocks. You know, should we be so lucky? No, you had you mentioned stagflation and how we really are seeing that play out. Now, the officials have have been wrong <laughs> kind of this whole time about that inflation was going to be transitory. And you recently wrote, wrote about how really the official narrative from the mainstream has been wrong very consistently. When it comes to going forward, then how do we forecast the future then if everything that we're hearing from the mainstream has been wrong and probably will continue to be wrong going forward? Well, I suspect that the audience of liberty and finance is used to contrarian thinking or outside the box thinking, or at least you know, cautious about accepting anything from the powers that be. So maybe not so difficult for our audience here to ponder this. But the, the key point is that and these guys have economic models. And one of the main things, and you see this in their policy, like you hear people saying, well, uh, why do these central banks keep saying they want, you know, they have the target inflation point. They want inflation. You know, 2% inflation is good. That's our goal. Well, that's because their models say that inflation comes from economic activity. So if you want, a, you know, a steady, healthy, growing economy, the price for that is a steady rate of inflation. So it's not that they actually are saying, oh, we want to debase our currency. They're saying we want to have a healthy growing economy and the sign of that is inflation. That's wrong. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, we won't get into the whole economic argument for why, but, but that's wrong. And so if your understanding is wrong, your model is wrong. You know, if you're the, the pilot and you're navigating based on this map that's wrong, you're not going to get where you want to go. So another free article at independentspeculator.com, it's called the, the Wrong Way Corrigans of Economics. You can see that on the homepage or search for a Wrong Way Corrigan. Uh, just quick historical note, uh, Wrong Way Corrigan was not an idiot. He didn't fly across the ocean to Ireland instead of across the United States to California by accident. Nobody flies across the ocean by accident without noticing, it, you know, in 1938, as, as low as you're flying, that you're flying over the ocean. It was a stunt. But the... The announced plan was to fly back west to California. He flies east, goes to Ireland, and he gets the nickname Wrong Way Corrigan. Um, our Wrong Way Corrigans in economics today are not pulling a stunt. They, they are looking at the map upside down or backwards or something. The map just doesn't comprehend or believe what Milton Friedman said about uh, inflation being always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And... Um, you know, they're, they're making mistakes and they're informing policy decisions that I think are mistakes. And that is one reason why I think the stagflation will be protracted and painful. It, you know, they don't have the right tools. They keep saying they have the tools. Uh, they don't. 
you know, cutting demand doesn't do anything if your supply isn't there, if it's disrupted. And, you know, if you're, if you're cutting demand by tightening economic conditions, but that causes the government to send people more free checks, which is still happening. There are governments, you know, in North America and around the world, sending people free money to fight inflation. So they are literally fighting inflation with inflation. It, that's not a metaphor. It's not hyperbole. That is literally true, at least if you subscribe to a monetary root cause with delays of inflation. Um, so I think this is big. I think it's important. You know, hopefully, I'm not terribly hopeful about economics, but, you know, hopefully people learn a lesson from this. If if not the economists themselves and the larger world, perhaps, will we'll get a clue or be hit by the clue by four. We'll see what happens. Um, but buckle up, Elijah, is the point here. If if the pilots have the wrong map, you know, clueless wrong way corrigans, it, uh, it, we could be in for a world of hurt. You know, make sure you've got your, your gold and silver bullion if things get really bad which are not investments. That's not investment advice. That's, you know, gold and silver as insurance, the ultimate form of liquidity in time of need. That's how I see my savings in gold and silver. And it does seem like we're going to continue to see inflation going forward. You wrote about this recently and how it's really like the triple digit oil prices. I mean, those are here to stay. Can you share with our viewers some more reasons on why you see that? And really, if we do see high oil prices, going forward, I mean, that impacts everything um, because of transportation and all that. So your perspective on that? Well, transport, I mean, it's energy. Everything is energy. I mean, your, your body turns food and energy, get anything done. Energy is a, an input cost to absolutely everything. So if energy costs are higher, the cost of life is higher. It's just that simple. Now, why, how, what does it mean? Uh, let me first say, I'm not saying oil will never dip below $100 again. Of course it will. It will fluctuate. But for many years now, it's been fluctuating around 60 plus or minus. And, you know, last millennium, at the end of last millennium, it was fluctuating at a much lower level, right? Around 30 or whatever it was. So you get these different plateaus as the energy scape around the world changes. And that's what I'm saying. We've had a phase change, paradigm shift, whatever you want to call it. I call it the new Iron Curtain. In this new Cold War era, this new Iron Curtain era, where you take out Russia and potentially Russia allies, and you put them on the other side of a new Iron Curtain, you are making the entire energy economy, you know, you're dividing it, you're deglobalizing, you're making less efficient, you're making it more expensive. Now, of course, oil is literally a liquid asset, right? It can flow around, and if the Russians don't sell to Europe, they'll sell to China. But that takes time. You've got to build the pipelines. You've got to build the infrastructure to do that. You, know, you, you can't do the flip of the switch. So ultimately, things stabilize, I think, in the new normal. But that new normal will be less efficient than the old one. A deglobalized, you know, with a great big new iron curtain right in the middle of it, whatever prices settle at that new normal, I think it will be significantly higher. And I would not, you know, with inflation hitting everything, I would expect it actually to remain around triple digits or higher. In the near term, there's also potential for massive spike is higher. We have, you know, China finally seems to be winding down its lockdowns. And we've got the summer, you know, travel surge coming. And there's a lot of talk now about how consumers are strapped. And, you know, maybe there'll be less spending than we thought. And maybe there will be less spending on lawn chairs and other things from Walmart. But I think people that have been cooped up for a couple of years, they're going to want to go out anyway. And maybe they won't drive as far. Maybe they won't fly to Tahiti. Maybe they'll go to Puerto Rico instead. But I think they're going to want to get out and party. And I, I still think we're going to see, uh, I, I still think we're going to see inflationary surge from the great reopening this summer, including and starting with energy prices. And that again just kind of goes back to how you know the officials have been so wrong on this. I mean, the Fed is trying to tighten and bring down inflation, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Yeah, a really striking thing. I'm, I'm not a Kramer fan. I'm not a terribly CNBC fan in general, but I happen to see a clip on YouTube of Kramer being interviewed on CNBC. And he's shaking his head and he's, 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 he's almost like in tears saying the Fed just got it wrong. They're just wrong about inflation. And I was wrong. You know, he admitted, you know, I was wrong. They were wrong. They got to change. They got to do 75 basis points right now. Um, 
you know how he is. He's very about, you know, he's that guy with that giant red, bye, 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 but, you know, sell, 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 but, you know, so he has to, you know, wave his arms and jump up and down when he says these things. But it was really striking to see a mainstream media personality like that, financial media personality, like almost in tears. You can, you can Google search this on YouTube. You know, Kramer on the Fed getting it wrong. I don't know what it was called, the segment, but it just really impressed me. Like mainstream people are starting to get it. They're starting to panic. They're, maybe they're getting an idea that the wrong way Corrigans of economics aren't looking at the right map. Uh, hopefully that opens an opportunity for things to get better. But I have a feeling they're just going to fly that plane right into a mountain. So better safe than sorry. Batten down the hatches is the message here, Elijah. All right. And if our viewers are interested in learning more, they can go to independentspeculator.com. We'll put the link in the description of this video. Any last thoughts before we let you go? Well, we've covered a lot of ground, Elijah. Appreciate the opportunity, though. Maybe one quick thought would be we've talked before about the green agenda versus not my backyard thinking for resource investors. I do think that the green agenda is more important to the powers that be, and therefore mining and extractive industries will get a, a boost or benefit for permitting and that sort of stuff. But I think it will take time. I think this is a mega trend that will play out over decades. And I actually think we might see it going the wrong way first. Like in the US, they're not easing up on permitting. They're trying to subsidize politically correct minds. <laughs> it doesn't do any good if they can't get permitting. In Australia, I just had an election. The new president coming in there, or prime minister, says, oh, we're going to be a renewable energy superpower. You know, what does that even mean? Uh, you know, does that mean they're going to allow more mining so that they can provide the critical minerals for renewable energy? doesn't sound like it. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, again, batten down the hatches. This can get really bumpy, but it can create, I think, opportunities for, you know, companies that can deliver good ESG creds on the, quote, right side of the new iron curtain could have huge advantages and deliver big wins for shareholders as this green agenda versus NIMBY thinking plays out. All right. Well, Lobo, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thank you, Elijah. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.